about publishing employer gender pay gaps. Uh, I'm Mary Wooldridge, I'm the CEO of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency and today I'm actually uh, found a quiet nook in Parliament House in Canberra because uh, soon after this session, I'm actually going to do a press conference with Minister Katie Gallagher, the Minister for Women, uh, to um, talk about uh, the results. And as you hopefully have seen, we've already had quite a bit of media coverage. Because today is a very significant step forward in our understanding of gender equality in Australian workplaces. Uh, it both embeds transparency into our national approach, but it also uh, gives us information and knowledge that we haven't had had before about individual employer performance uh, and what that looks like so that it can be a catalyst for change. And very much today is about transparency, but that accountability that comes with that in relation to uh, the employer's performance in terms of today's results, both uh, in a standalone capacity, but also relative to their industry and their peers. Um, but it's also a starting point for measuring over time. We've given the opportunity for employers to publish an employer statement uh, alongside their gender pay gap on our data explorer. And uh, that puts context because while the gender pay gap is a, a really important proxy for gender equality. It is just one number and we know that it's a lot more complex uh, than, than just one number. Um, but this information today equips uh, employers, employees, customers, investors, everyone uh, to be able to start that conversation about what's really driving the gender pay gap uh, and what do we need to do to fix it. And employers are clearly in the frame in relation to leading, driving and delivering uh, improvements uh, on that front. Um, from Wajia's perspective, uh, we obviously have a critical role in measuring and publishing the data uh, and making sure that we use a consistent methodology and that we do that over time. But we also have a critical role supporting employers to understand the importance of gender equality and to develop and implement a, a plan for change. So anyone who's online uh, who uh, is looking for more tools and resources, ideas, life masterclasses, all the different ways um, that we can support please go to our website uh, along with finding the data explorer there. So what are the key results? Uh, what we find is that uh, when we look at uh, on a national basis, uh, the median gender pay gap for total remuneration is 19%. Uh, um, but when we look at all employers and look at them on uh, as, as a comparison to each other, 50% uh, of employers have a gender pay gap higher than 9.1%. Um, and that's often the benchmark and comparison. Uh, and once again, on our website, Site, we've got a lot of detail that sits uh, behind that in terms of individual employers' performance. We're saying that plus or minus 5% is the target range. So obviously we should be aiming for zero, but understand there's some uh, complexities and flexibility in that. So 30% of employers have a median gender pay gap uh, in that plus or minus 5%, uh, which is a great result, um, but uh, they certainly, no one can rest on their laurels in relation to these issues. Uh, as we've said, this is one measure. But nearly two thirds of employers do have a gender pay gap in favour of men and about 8% actually have a gender pay gap in favour of women. Um, every single industry though does have that gender pay gap in favour of men. But interestingly, once again, there is quite a range. So while construction, financial services uh, and uh, professional services are the highest overall, um, even in those industries, there are employers who have a gender pay gap uh, in that plus or minus 5% range. So it's doable, it's possible. Uh, and what we really need to do is make sure that we're, um, uh, you know, that, that we're encouraging employers to understand what's driving their gap and to um, to make the the changes, put in place the plans, build the teams, uh, put in place the KPIs, uh, and make the change happen. So we've got some good uh, questions coming in, um, and uh, I, I'm going to got Lucy. Uh, on uh, just beside me here, who's going to let uh, let us know some of the questions. So Lucy, what's first up? Thanks, Mary. 
first question is from Amy. She says, a lot of employers are saying that they don't have a like-for-like like gap. Is this a valid response? It has been a, a very consistent response this morning uh, in terms of the media when, uh, the, when employers have been asked that question. Now, like-for-like like or equal pay for equal work has been the law in Australia for over 50 years. So, absolutely. Um, we need to, employers need to be delivering that. It's the law uh, and uh, so they should be and they need to remain vigilant in terms of delivering that. But the gender pay gap measures something different. It measures um, the overall workforce, not only pay, but it also is uh, composition is a very big driver. Have we got women in those higher paying roles um, or are all the women clustered around the lower paying roles? Um, what we see when we look at, uh, we've also released quartiles in terms of composition today, what we see is that um, uh, men are doubly likely as women to be in that highest paying range and women are 50 percent more likely to be in that lowest paying range um, so you know like for like is ground zero uh, of course they have to have that it's actually what what needs to happen from there uh, in terms of looking at what's driving the gender pay gap and address that Thanks. The second question is from Georgie. Are there any industries that are doing particularly badly or particularly well? So, uh, as I've mentioned, there's some key industries like construction, financial services and uh, uh, professional services where um, they are, they do have on average, the, you know, the higher gender pay gaps. Um, but uh, there are, you know, companies in those industries as well who are close to um, close to zero. Um, so employers really need to be looking at what's driving their individual gaps and what can be done. And in some areas, sectors are also taking that on board. We're currently working with uh, members of the construction sector where they're saying there's things that employers can do, but there's things we need to do as a sector, such as change the perception that it's a uh, an industry for men um, and and think about how we can actively recruit women um, so that we're recruiting from 100% of the workforce not just 50% uh, as we grow and we need more workers. Sarah asks our calculation of our data using the WGEA formula does not align with what is published on the data explorer for our organization how do we go about investigating this? So uh, um, any individual situation, uh, email our GS support line and we can absolutely uh, look at that and work that through. Kim asks, how do we verify the information employers have reported? For example, do we think that employers can wash numbers like we have seen in greenwashing sustainability measures? So this has been part of Wajia reporting for 10 years in terms of uh, how we uh, how the numbers are verified. Um, uh, and it happens in a number of different ways. First of all, the CEO is required to sign off on the submission uh, to make sure that they verify the numbers that they're providing uh, to us as a government agency. Uh, secondly, those reports, uh, the summary reports are required to be provided to employees and also now from this year to their board. Uh, so there's some transparency of those who are living and working uh, in that environment about whether the the numbers uh, that are presented feel right and seem right in terms of the the actual experience and that includes the policies and practices as well um, and of course now we're publishing gender pay gaps that brings a, an accountability uh, for those numbers as well which well, does have the capacity to audit it's not something that we use often um, but we do rely on um, the CEO signing off uh, on the numbers that they've provided. Vivian asks, is there an avenue to follow up on companies with over 100 employees that don't appear in the Wajir data that's been published? So, uh, and it's a great question. There are a small number of companies uh, that, uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, may not appear. And uh, let me just take you through a couple just to give you a sense. But there is a detailed list on our website uh, about those reasons. Uh, the first may be that they're non-compliant, that they haven't reported uh, when they're required to. Uh, another one might be for, for last year, for this year's reporting, um, some companies report is a what's called a submission group as part of a 
corporate group, um, not just a standalone company. And so uh, multiple subsidiaries may be caught up in, a, in one submission group. From next year, we will be publishing each of those individual companies, um, as well as the, the broader corporate structures. Um, and you know, many, many cases when I get asked about this, the company uh, may not have uh, 100 or more employees. So there's a variety of different reasons. Um, and there's a, number, there's a small number of companies that are just not known to AGEA in relation to uh, the requirement to report. And uh, presumably, they don't know either. And we continue to try and uh, find them and notify them of their requirements. Navanita asks, is there further disaggregation beyond the binary women and men? Have employers gone above and beyond in looking at an intersectional disaggregation and reporting? So currently our act actually, which was 10 years ago, requires us to report on women and men. In the last couple of years, we've had a voluntary question that employers can also um, identify non-binary employees. Uh, and currently about 20% of companies do do that. Uh, where We have a recommendation from the review of our act, uh, one of which was to publish gender pay gaps, which we're doing now. And we're doing some more work on how we can have a broader definition of gender um, and that employers would be required to report to us on that basis. So we're working to be able to do that. Um, uh, and what we need to, of course, do is also make sure we can support employers to create a safe environment to collect that information uh, so that they're able to report it to us. So some companies have that information already, um, and we're certainly working at a national level uh, to be able to collect that information and do that more detailed intersectional analysis. Okay, we're going to take two more questions. Talene asks, what are the learnings from the UK and other countries that have introduced similar changes and the reaction from stakeholders? So, uh, great question there. And actually, I can direct people to our website where we do have a uh, short summary of the literature from uh, what's been uh, coming out of the research from UK's publishing gender pay gaps. Uh, and what they found at a high level is that the gender pay gaps have reduced. It hasn't been a huge number, um, but the reductions are sustained over time. And that's exactly what we want. We know this is a complex issue and we need to get that momentum going uh, and have that focus. There's also been uh, an increased focus on the gender equality issues at boards in terms of information, discussion and action. Um, and we're even seeing uh, employee, prospective employee responses. Some recent research has shown that uh, some women are making a choice to take a slightly lower salary, but to work at an employer who has a lower gender pay gap than one who has a higher one. Um, obviously, you know, connecting, you would think, to the fact that uh, they understand that they're going into an environment that's more conducive for women, um, and also uh, their career prospects over time might be better. So please have a look at that at UK literature review on our website. Final question, Adrian asks, how does the data consider part-time shared roles? A comment I got this morning was the was that she said that the person knew a lot of women who were doing shared senior roles. So this is an important methodology in terms of how we calculate gender pay gaps. Um, we, we know uh, the vast majority of people who are working part-time are women. Um, and when the ABS calculates a gender pay gap, they only use full-time employees. They don't look at part-time roles. We take a part-time role and annualise it to a full-time equivalent role so that it is compared on a like for like an equivalent basis uh, to other full-time roles. So this does reflect um, the full-time equivalent uh, gender pay gaps in terms of all of these numbers. So anyone who says, oh, it's not a valid comparison, part-time's different, um, we've, we've done the equalisation to make sure that it is a fair comparison. Uh, thanks very much for everyone for joining us today. There's uh, a lot more questions and um, we'll work to get back uh, answers to them online. Uh, but just wanted to check in today, an important day, an important step forward uh, for gender equality in Australian workplaces. Uh, and once again, um, our website has a lot more information both about the numbers, but also for people who are um, leading organisations who are in HR or D diversity and inclusion um, or are leading teams um, as a manager uh, about how you can work to create a more gender equal environment in your workplace because that's really what we're striving to achieve. Thanks very much everyone. Have a good day.